Now, what's the dividing line here? When does this nitrogen start protonating? How low does the pH have to be for this nitrogen to start protonating? 9.6. If you look at your table, the pKa of this nitrogen is 9.6. So as long as this pH was lower than 9.6, we would expect this to protonate. And how low did the pH have to be for the carboxy group to be protonated? Lower than 9.6? Because when it's lower, it's more protonated. So once it hits 9.6, that's when it's going to start Don't have to protonate. look at a separate number? It's 2.8. Yeah, going back to the nitrogen, when will the nitrogen be, when will this be the main form of the nitrogen when the pH is lower than 9.6? That's right. So when, uh, of course, I didn't leave any room for error here. This is way lower than 9.6. But when we are at, uh, lower than 9.6, this would be the, the major form what of this thing. at 9.6? Because a lot of times for mm -hmm. PI, he has that value. Right. So well, if the pH was lower than 9.6, the majority of the nitrogen would be in this form. If the pH is greater than 9.6, the majority of the nitrogens would be in this form. So if the pH is exactly at 9.6, then we should have equal amounts of these two forms. That's actually a good question, because he actually likes to ask that type of question uh, on the sample exams. Oftentimes he'll say, at what pH will these two forms be, be existing in, rough, in equal amounts? And, and the answer is, at the pKa. And is that the sweater iron? It's Let's see. Actually, the sweater iron turns out to be a more complicated concept than that, so we'll have to get to that later. So yeah, this is different from the sweater iron. The sweater iron involves taking into account all the charges on the amino acid. All we're doing so far is just paying attention to the charge on the nitrogen. So we'll have to get to that bitter ion later. But when will the two forms of nitrogen exist in equal amounts when the pH here is equal to 9.6? You can actually prove that easily from the henderson hasselbalch equation, which I think is going to give you on the test as well. But we can just memorize that, that when we're at the peak, that pKa, there'll be equal amounts of these two substances. And for COOH, we look at another whole number. We look at 2.3. That's right. Now the cutoff for the pH is 2.3. In order for this to be protonated, the P, uh, in order for this to be the major form of the carboxy, the pH should be lower than 2.3. And in order for this to be the major form of the carboxy, the pH should be greater than 2.3, because the table told us the pKa of that carboxy group is 2.3. By the way, notice that they call that the alpha carboxy, because it's on the alpha carbon, and they called these pKa's for the alpha amino, because it's on the alpha carbon, so it always comes back to looking at the alpha groups. Just if you look at the top of the column here, they said uh, pKa of the alpha carboxy and the alpha amino. Alpha Just to indicate that those are the, this is the carboxy on the alpha carbon, and this is the amino on the alpha carbon, that's how they're distinguishing them from any groups that might be on the side chain. Okay. Thanks. That's just one more indication of how important it is to label the alpha carbon. So let's say that I had a pH, well, so at a pH of 1, what's the net charge on glycine? At a pH of 1, what's the net charge on glycine? We've kind of already worked that out on the board. Plus one. We've already worked out that at this pH of one, these are the forms of the amino and the carboxy. And overall, then, we have a plus one charge. And at a pH of 13, what's the net charge on the glycine? Minus one. How about at a pH of five? At a pH of five, would the amine nitrogen be protonated or deprotonated? Protonated? Yes, because 5 is lower than this benchmark. And would the carboxy group be protonated or deprotonated? Deprotonated. Deprotonated because relative to this benchmark, this is a high pH. More basic solution. Yeah. Relative to this benchmark, this seems like a basic solution, which would tend to deprotonate it. Relative to this benchmark, it seems like an acidic solution, which would tend to protonate the nitrogen. But relative to the benchmark for the carboxy group, it's relatively acidic and would tend to deprotonate it. So at this pH, what's the net charge? Neutral. Zero net charge. That's correct. 
that Zwitter ion is the form with a zero net charge. That's something we should have in our notes. A Zwitter ion is the form with zero net charge. Zwitter ion is the form with zero net charge. By the way, zwei is German for two. So this is kind of a two charge ion. Zwitter ion means that there's two ions here. But even though there's two ions, the net charge is still zero. So it turns out that glycine has three different possible charge states. These are the three different possible charge states for glycine. Even though glycine is just about the simplest amino acid you can find, it still has three different charge states. Let's move on now to alanine. How would we draw alanine? What do I, what do I have to do this picture to make this look like alanine? What do I have to put on the alpha carbon? Yeah, just, just a CH3. So alanine, they, in the table it says CH3, that means a CH3 attached to the alpha carbon. And we could go through the same exercise again, uh, figuring out what the pHs have to be to protonate the amine and their carboxy groups. Notice that the pKs are slightly different. Actually, they're pretty similar, but they're slightly different for each amino acid, although the pKs for the carboxy and the amino groups tend to be pretty much the same. Well, moving on down, how about valine? What should I put here now? Who's going to be connected here? So one carbon and then going off of that two Right. Methyls. The key thing is connected to this carbon is going to be that CH group. It's the CH group that's connected to the alpha carbon. And then, like you said, there's two separate methyl groups. Good. How about for leucine? Sorry? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Those methyl groups are going off of the, don't they go off of the that's right. We know that in condensed notation, it's, it's conventional sometimes to put the dash coming out from the hydrogen. Everyone knows the hydrogen can't be attached to two things. After all, are, are you worried about the hydrogen being attached to the methyl group here? Yeah, so when I draw it, I can keep the methyl the carbon. That seems fine. After all, isn't this a conventional way of drawing propane? This yes. is a perfectly conventional way of drawing propane. No one thinks that this means the hydrogens are connected to this okay. carbon. Okay. It's good to watch out for things like that. But in this case, that would be fine. It's true that you can't always do that. If this was an alcohol, it wouldn't be conventional to draw it this way. Uh, but it's conventional to, if you have a C to, to draw the dash from the hydrogen. But if it made you feel uncomfortable, it would be perfectly fine to draw it like this. That would be fine too. It's true that uh, sometimes those details can make a difference. And if there are no pH values given, we can just draw any form, protonated, deprotonated. Yeah, if there's no pH values given, then um, usually he's going to give you a pH value. But if he doesn't give you the pH value, then you can, I guess, draw any, any forms of protonation. That's right. Okay. And that's a nonpolar side chain, right? Let's see. It's nonpolar, and it's also not acidic or basic. That's right. Yeah, this is a nonpolar side chain. We don't need to memorize that. We know that carbon hydrogen chains are nonpolar, so that we can see this is nonpolar by looking at it. And carbon methyl is kind of like nonpolar, carbon hydrogen. Right, a methyl is a carbon hydrogen. So anything that's just got carbons and hydrogens is going to be nonpolar. Okay. That's right. It's polar if there's something electronegative taking it. That's right, because what does it mean if it's a polar chain? It means it has polar bonds. And where do we get polar bonds? From electronegativity differences. Okay, thanks. All right, well, just moving uh, down the line in uh, leucine, what's the group that should be attached here? Um, isopropyl well, first of all, I'm just going at, we've attached the CH2. And then you should be able to draw the rest of it based on what they have in the table. The key thing is, you were asking before, how do you know who's attached to the alpha carbon? Yeah, if you know yeah, who's attached yeah. to the alpha carbon, then it makes sense. It makes sense when you said the octet, so that fourth thing right. is surrounded by the carbon. That's how about isoleucine? Which carbon would be attached here? Is that CH3? Yeah. yeah. For isoleucine? Mm -hmm. That's right. So which carbon should I attach here? Um, to that CH3? No. No, to the C. Which carbon should be attached to the alpha carbon for isoleucine? The one that's CH. That's right. Again, you can tell because that's the one that doesn't have the complete octet. That's the one that doesn't have a complete octet in the picture, so it must be attached to somebody else. But when you attach it, won't there be three things attached to it? Yeah. Oh. Oh, because it's, it's written in that stupid way, so... So if we draw the whole picture for the isoleucine, it would look like this. 
So that carbon is, if you just look at the table, you can see that this carbon is attached to two other carbons and a hydrogen. So it needs one more thing to be attached to. Well, that last thing can be this alpha carbon here. Yeah, that looks like what I have in fourth. That's right. That would be isolated scene. 